thank you for that. We're now going to move on to the discussion panel. If you've got any questions for me, I'll take them uh, during the, the course of the discussion uh, process here. So I'd like to invite our panellists to join us up on the, uh, the platform here. So while they're coming, joining um, David Naylor, our panellists are Lynn George. Lynn is Vice President and uh, European Claims Manager at Chubb. In her spare time, Lynn is a very keen horse rider and a keen motorcyclist. And she's so far managed to avoid confusing the techniques and skills required for each activity, which could be disastrous and possibly end in some serious claims. David Lang, we have, who's Head of Claims at Lloyd's. Uh, David took over the top spot from Kent Chaplin, who many of you will know. And David is a very keen golfer. In another life, he would have liked to have been a professional. And uh, in fact, he recently took some time out to increase the speed of his golf swing by 10 miles an hour, which is an attention to detail that surely betrays his actuarial background. And we have Robert Kastner. Robert's head of claims at New Line Group. Robert's a lawyer by profession, and he's practiced in both New York and London, so I expect he's got it right by now. And his Austrian origins from Vienna have given him a love of classical music and skiing, not to mention those delicious pastries. Robert's both a keen trumpeter and a cyclist, though um, not, not both at the same time, I'm happy to say, <laughs> especially when he cycles to work. And Robert is very keen to say, as a cyclist in London, that he's one of those people who do follow the highway code. So this session is going to be a bit like uh, any yep. questions, uh, except without Dave Dim Dimbleby or an audience of, uh, of televisual millions. So with that level of privacy and intimacy, I'd like to encourage you all to take the opportunity to participate with questions and challenges for the panel. We'll be exploring the issues surrounding claims transformation, its widest sense across the London market. Uh, you've heard some of the introductions, the, the two presentations already so far, which have touched on various areas in there. What I'm going to do first of all, before we come on to the questioning section, is to ask each of the panellists to make a brief introductory statement, a short statement as an introduction to their thoughts uh, on this area, and then we shall move forward to enlivening the discussion with your input. So, um, Lynn, perhaps you'd like to start us off. Okay, is that ladies first? It is <laughs> ladies first, indeed. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess when we're talking about the things that um, cause me some concern or the challenges that I think that we face generally today, is that I think it's come up with some of the discussions that we've had, is that are we fast enough? And it seems clearly with the amount of innovation that's going on, particularly in the computer world and IT, that um, I often challenge with ourselves that we are not. And it's, are we fast enough? Are we able to respond to our customer needs? Are we listening to our customers enough? Are we retaining our good people? Um, looking at the larger losses and the, the cats that we've all experienced in the last year or so, um, how we're responding to that as a market. And looking at the ways in which insurers, are we communicating with each other enough in those areas? So there, there are an awful lot of subjects that, that make me think at night about what we're doing and how we're going forward in our market. But it's also in relation to those larger losses, you know, the trends that we're, we're spotting in that things are more complicated, they, they seem to be more complex now. Policy wordings, we need to be more accurate about those. I think that came up with one of the things that one of the speakers talked about earlier. So there's an awful lot of things that I think that, that we need to concentrate on, but certainly from when it claims it claims environment, it's, you know, are we delivering what the promises that we've made? And, um, and that's always a challenge. Thank you. David, perhaps you'd like to take a second? Um, yeah, just a couple of observations. One, the Lloyd's Claims Transformation Programme, just talk briefly about that. Flexibility with enhanced standards, that's where we're trying to get to. Um, just to give an indication, we've got about 215,000 open claims in the Lloyd's market. At the moment, about 75,000 of those are singletons, i.e. there's only one party involved. Um, and so that leaves 140,000, and of those, about 8,000 are in the new world of, of CTP. That's growing uh, exponentially at the moment, so there'll be a lot more, be a lot more in that area. The question about sort of is that working? I mean, the original metric was to try and get a 25% increase in speed. We're currently running at about a 39% increase in speed. It's a metric. It measures one particular thing. It doesn't answer the whole question. Where are we trying to get to? A few ideas out there at the moment, and all of these are sort of in the public domain, so no, no secrets here. Um, broker portal. How do we make it easier for an entity, be that a broker, be it an insured, be it a TPA, to actually make a claim into the Lloyds market? We've had lots of comments about the volume claim service we're trying to sort of look at potentially introducing. And the question then is, again, if we've got a lack of resource, why are we not using that resource where we get most bang for the buck? How do we actually utilise that? We're trying to get market responses in place, not only for natural catastrophes, 
but also for things like Madoff. Why isn't there a market response in regard to Madoff? It makes entire sense when you look at it. And finally, one of the things I think, again, the great thing about metrics and statistics is, I mean, I, I could sit here, and I will now, um, tell you that Lloyd's ECF turnaround has improved from 4.8 to 3.2 days over, over the last two months. Has anybody in this room any idea what that means to an insured? It's quicker, but so what? The answer is it's a great performance by the market, but it doesn't mean anything. One of the things we have to do as a market, uh, that means everybody involved in the process is understand what it means for the insured, what all the parameters are, and how we make that insured experience better. Thank you, David. Good. Well, perhaps you'd like to take a thank, thank you, Graham. Um, I think my starting point to the various topics that uh, were in the sheet, which I studied carefully, of course, um, is that the market seems to adopt a one-size-fits-all approach to um, its, its market-wide solutions. And it rolls out a system or a procedure or a process and says, that's the system that's going to apply to all classes, to all market segments, to all insurers, large or small. And not often enough thought is put into how particular market segments, particular classes of business, particular organizations might respond to that or might deal with that and actually whether it will work for them and produce a better outcome. And sometimes it does, and actually sometimes it doesn't. And if you're going to roll out a, a market-wide system or a Lloyd's-wide system, I think that more thought needs to be given to the detailed impact that it's going to have on the different classes. And we saw this with, well, I think ECF was, was, was probably a good example. Now, I have to say, I sit here and I'm my claims team will kill me for saying it, but I think ECF is a fantastic platform. I think it's a brilliant idea and it's a massive step forward in the right direction. But unfortunately, for those people who know ECF, when it started a few years ago, it was a, well, a very, very cronky old system that was given a facelift and not a particularly good facelift at that. And since then, the market's been struggling to improve ECF and we've had ECF too. But actually, we have a users group that has a list as long as my arm and probably longer of um, innovations and corrections that need to be made to that. And that's going to be delivered over the next two, maybe three years. And I, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think that our customers are getting the best service that way. I don't think that our insureds are seeing the benefits of innovation in the market when it's delivered in that way. I think it would be far better to have identified actually the goals that you want to achieve and invest up front rather than doing it in the piecemeal fashion. And while I'm all in favor of getting speed down to the lowest possible, or the highest possible, whichever way you look at it, um, point, um, I don't think speed for the sake of it is a goal that should be achieved. Um, <coughs> David had a slide up earlier with the, the, the two and a half to three years for the PI claim, and he made the very valid point. Well, what does that mean? Um, if I was a solicitor or an accountant or a, a, a surveyor or an architect, and um, my insurer was selling itself on the basis that it turns my claims around and pays all my claims within 10 seconds flat. I wouldn't go to that insurer. Well, first of all, you'd be broke within 10 seconds. But the point is, I may say, well, that claim's not actually a valid claim. The third party that's making that claim is making a claim that hasn't got a basis for it. There's no substance to it. And I want it to be fought, and I want it to be defended, and I want to have my day in court because I think I'll prevail. So it may well take two and a half. It may take three or four years to have that matter resolved. But ultimately, when my insurer has paid the costs of that and we've won the day, will I look back and say that four years was the right time and that was a great experience? Well, I may well do, and I may say that was fantastic, and I got the service that I paid for, and I'm very pleased I'll renew. Um, Thank you. Right. David, you had a chance earlier on to talk about all sorts of things, but would you like to take us, introduce us into some of your ideas on this section? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, yeah, I have had my say. Um, there's, there's three things, actually, I think we need to think about. One is the systems and, um, and how the systems work. Now, I, I work with a number of insureds who can log on to their uh, lawyers' uh, websites and see live billing information, live document creation information, can see all the documents that are, on, that are filed there. So let's think about getting uh, on the, the large buyers, the insureds involved in the system as well. Um, but don't, don't sell the market based on the fact we've got this new system. Because uh, frankly, the, the insureds are shocked to hear you haven't had it for 10 years already. <laughs> um, communications, um, I kept banging on about, and um, uh, the key one in 
Um, I think a lot of the claims, and where I see a real difference in whether a claim is handled well or not, is the people. It's the people on the floor, it's the people in the claims team. How well resourced they are, how good they are, how well trained they are. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Right, so some interesting themes coming out there, and I've uh, <coughs> just taking a few notes as we were going along. Uh, speed, obviously, is something which uh, has been mentioned quite, quite a lot, but not just speed for its own sake. This has got to be appropriate levels of response, not just fast levels of response. Communication uh, is coming out again and again. Quality of communication, timeliness of communication, and so on. And definitely something about flexibility, about meeting needs, about being able to move away from just standard responses and being able to meet the needs of the market and the needs of the client. Um, interesting point Robert making about the one-size-fits-all approach. We have the potential of a dichotomy there between making the best use of the talent we've got, and talent is something we want to come onto in this session because you know, there is this perception of being shortage of talent, how do we manage that, and making the best use of the resources. Well, sometimes pooling resources and having something that goes across the market can be one of the best ways of doing it. But what are the pitfalls in that one-size-fits-all approach? How can we deal with that? Uh, and again, Things like the people, again, coming back to that quality, that, uh, the, the issue of talent, the quality of the people involved is absolutely critical because no matter what systems you put in place, if you haven't got the right quality of people, they're just going to do bad things more quickly, which is not necessarily <laughs> the right thing. So some interesting things coming out there. Yeah. Now, here's your opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like uh, some, some questions for the, for the floor. We have a, just a, a way of um, housekeeping here. We have a roving mic, and to make sure everyone in the room hears your question, could you wait, put your hand up, wait until the mic comes to you, and if you wouldn't mind saying your name and your company, just to introduce before you introduce your question, that would be ideal. So, let's see, who would like to go first? I'm sure somebody will. Yes, somebody over there, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Philip, Gosh. Philip Hodges from Agent Support. Um, I think I'd like to hear a bit more from, from David, Dave Nelly, because in your presentation, you were actually quite, quite damning. I mean, your, uh, your, your household claim was uh, very, very prompt and, and well executed, and, and you came forward with some things that people should be, should be doing. Um, but, uh, and just at the end there, you actually mentioned that, well, people are key to this. Then, then that might suggest that, well, the thing that needs to be done is just to train people. That, that might be one, one answer. But the, the other thing, and just widening out the, uh, the response from the rest of the panel as well, is that I think earlier on it was pointed out that, that the claim actually starts with a policy. Is that it, you know, if, the, if the policy is written and it is just left on the shelf without an expectation that perhaps one day somebody might claim against that, that that's when there's actually already a, a breakdown between what was written and then when the claim comes in. So uh, I'd be particularly keen to hear a bit more from, from David about what he really thinks needs to be done or uh, good examples that he's actually seen. And then uh, uh, hear from the panel about um, are we not doing enough to actually start looking at claims from the start of the policy in understanding what potential claims might be. Good, thank you. David. Thank you. Um, Things have got better. Things have got a lot better. I mean, Robert and I first worked together, I don't know, a dozen years ago in a law firm. Um, and certainly I was working on, uh, on claims for the market where there was no policy issued. Um, and that was, uh, that was an interesting time. Um, so things have got better. Um, how, can I, how do I think we can improve it uh, from an insured perspective? I think we need better project management. Manage, sorry, let me say it project management skills, um, both in the market, in the broking houses, and with our clients. Um, th the risk manager is reporting to a board. He's doing a monthly report. He's telling them what's happening on the claim, what to expect, what the lawyers have said, when to expect an income, if any. Um, if that goes off track, or one of the deadlines, or one of his guesstimates of what's going to happen when isn't met, then that's when uh, things go wrong. That's when the board wants to know why the hell it hasn't happened. Um, so at the front end, in the policy, you could write out your, your response times. I think that's very difficult in, in um, the myriad of claims we see. You could have some basics. Um, but actually, the project management from the, the claims end of 
We have instructed external lawyers. We have asked them to report within three months. The reason it's going to take three months is this. And then if you've asked them to report in three months and you're going to get a letter to the insured, make sure you meet that deadline or you meet that timeline. Um, so that that guy, that risk manager who's gone to his board and said, I will be here next quarter and I will be telling you what insurers have said, actually has that because if he doesn't, he looks bad. Um, yes, I'm biased um, and the reason I'm biased is because in my role, I only see claims that go wrong. I have, um, I have five lawyers working for me um, and uh, overall about 20 other people doing claims. Um, so the 20 people who are doing the rest of the claims, they're the ones that just get paid. They're the ones that go through. They're the ones that aren't a problem. I only have uh, a quarter of as many people working on the claims where there's a problem. Um, so yes, I, I see it from the perspective of the problem claims. But looking at the problem claims, the, the issues I pick out of the problem claims are regularly the, um, the poor communication, the, the lack of expectation management. Um, and yes, brokers are guilty of that as well. Um, and uh, I think taking that through uh, training is very important at uh, broking houses um, and uh, for risk managers, for the buyers of insurance who um, often have done, if they've done a risk management course, have done perhaps a term, if you're lucky, uh, a few hours if you're unlucky of insurance work um, and uh, their understanding is, is not as broad as we might like. So they need to be part of the education process. Um, what can you do about it? Well, uh, I've had um, from the, the Lloyd's uh, Claims Talent uh, Programme, I've had uh, one of the guys from there who's sitting at uh, a law firm, a loss adjuster, a broking house, a syndicate over a, a year's period, was with me for, for three months. And we try and, um, try and work together to improve um, and, uh, and to show that we, we are a profession in claims that can attract good people, retain them, train them and um, hopefully not lose the good ones to underwriting because it pays 50% more. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, um, Liam, would you like to add to that? I think that when you talk about you know, the, the, uh, the policy's been written and it sits on a shelf and then it's years later that a claim is presented, I think the important thing is when we talked about collaboration, there's got to be collaboration between risk managers and claims and underwriters so that when that policy is put together, there is that discussion that takes place so that there is a management of expectations somewhere along the line. And I think often that doesn't happen. An underwriter will write a policy and they don't take into account or they don't make use of the knowledge and skills that there, there are within a claims department that can see some of the risks, can see some of the things that could potentially happen in the future. And that's why I think it's really important that when underwriters are writing new policies, coming up with new products, that they, there is that consultation with their colleagues in claims, because that, that, you know, that collaboration can make a huge difference. And certainly when they're then involved in discussions with risk managers, again helping to point out potential potholes or areas where there can be improvement, it, it can't be underrated. So I think that that's, that collaboration, and it all comes down to what you were saying about that communication, is vitally important. That's good, thank you. David, would you like to introduce the Lloyd's perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, I'd, the main thing from my perspective really is this, this, this transparency about the whole insurance and picking up the comment about claims at the start of the policy. Start of the policy. Let, let me just ask the audience a question, if I, if I may. I'll take about 15 seconds. Anybody who's got a motor insurance policy, could they just put their hand up, please? Okay. Anybody who has read, keep your hands up. Anybody who has read all of the terms and conditions underlying that motor policy, please keep your hand up. <laughs> okay. We're probably quite a sophisticated insurance audience sat in this room, and yet the vast majority <laughs> of us have never read the words. I've, how many of those people who have had a claim then subsequently go and try and A, find the relevant documentation, and B, try and find if it's actually covered. The point I'm trying to make is the insurance industry has an expectation that everybody understands all of the documentation we send to them. An example I'll give, a couple of weeks ago I was uh, out, out to dinner, I was speaking to someone, and they were a solicitor, they were a partner in a law firm. And I was talking about uh, insurance, and they said, I said, oh, who do you buy your insurance from? And they said, Aon. At that point I stopped because there's no point asking them what type of insurance coverage they've got because they will have no idea. They don't even know who the provider was. So what we've got to do is we've got to get an education back into the, our insureds 
as to what the product is that they're actually buying and what will happen in a claim scenario. But my personal view is a lot of the insurers aren't interested in what the scenario is under a claim until that event happens. So therefore, our going in position has to be first of all an education about what now happens. Again, final example, I had a, a motor insurance uh, claim. Uh, the first, I phoned up claims line, said, oh, thank you very much for the claim, took some details and said, how would you like to be communicated to? And so that's an interesting question. They said, we can write you letters, we can send you emails, we can send you texts, or we can phone you up. Isn't that lovely for someone to actually ask how I want to be communicated with? Because if, they, if, if the answer to me, text wasn't going to be the right answer, whatever. So if that organisation decided they were going to text everybody all their details, that wouldn't work. And I think the onus is on us, especially as we have the shift in the way we're using technology, to actually ask how people want to be communicated with us. Excellent, thank you. Robert, would you like to develop that idea? Oh. Uh, well, well, or even any well, other idea well, you might have, I, not well, just I, that one. I, I don't I, don't I, feel I, restricted I, by any means. Well, I was going to, actually going to say something about the, um, the, the contract formation stage, because... Um, um, as David correctly pointed out, we've both in private practice seen um, disputes on, on, on claims where there, there wasn't actually a contract wording at all. And if you were lucky, there was a slip with pretty much no information on it at all. And the Lloyd's Market developed this wonderful idea about eight or nine years ago called contract certainty. And you may well remember that. And the, it was a very novel idea where you actually had to have a contract at the time that the policy was bound. Um, something that probably brought us in line with where everyone else in the world was 50 years ago. Um, but it's, it's very easy to make light of that, but it actually um, doesn't give uh, in, enough credibility to the fact that the London market is an incredibly unique place. There's, al there's almost nowhere else in the world you can rock up, particularly to Lloyd's, and say, I want to insure this with that. And no one's, ever got a product, no one's got a product like that. There isn't a shelf you can go to and say, ah, you want this with that. Well, that's on shelf number three. That doesn't exist. You come to London, you go to a good broker, and a broker will find an underwriter, and together they will create a product just for you. Now, that means you're writing a contract just for you. It's not a, um, a, a motor policy that's been issued a thousand times that day by RSA or by Aviva or whomever. It's something that's been written just for you. And the people who write that contract are generally the broker and the underwriter, neither of whom are a lawyer, and um, neither of whom are really skilled in underwriting, sorry, excuse me, in writing a contract. Underwriting, yes, not, not actually writing the words. And then, unfortunately, if you do have a claim on that contract years later, you have some very expensive, highly paid lawyers who pour over every word and tear it apart and then start getting into the discussion of what the people must have meant when they used a particular word when actually the reality is that everybody knows that those two people who wrote that contract never actually had that discussion, that, that mind process at all. And what you, what you end up with is, is, is a marketplace that wants to offer a massive range, a wide range, a wide variety of products to its customers because that's what they want to buy, but then doesn't invest in the time, doesn't allow the underwriters and the brokers to engage in a meaningful enough dialogue because that process takes place, as you said, David, over about 12, 12 or 24 hours before the, the renewal date or the, or the date that the risk is actually needed. And to, a glass to, of wine. And a glass of wine. So that, that, that environment doesn't create a, a good place for a good discussion, a proper discussion, to create a wording that will actually work and will actually serve the needs of the customer. And if you throw into the mix the fact that the broker's under enormous pressure to get the best possible price, and he's hawking it around the market to see who's going to do it for cheaper, the first underwriter's thinking to himself, well, do I really want to invest enormous time and legal resource in writing a policy that actually will work when I'm not sure I'm actually going to get the business? Now, I don't have a good solution, but that is the problem. And that's why the contract wordings are not nearly as good as they could be and should be. Certainly not for bespoke pieces of business. Thank you. Thank you. Nice yeah. answer. A very comprehensive Sorry. answer to one question. Thank you very much for that. Um, some more questions from the floor, please. No? No. Shall I not now? Not coming yet. I'll give it a chance. A gentleman on this table here. Yes, that one there. Good afternoon, James McTavish, Short and Survey. I wanted to ask a general question to the whole panel, if I may, specifically about um, fraudulent claims and whether or not you feel that um, either from a data perspective or a general working practice perspective, what improvements can be made generally about trying to identify that particular area of claims? Who would like to ta start us with that, with that one? 
I don't Lynn? mind leaping in with Thank that. You. Yeah. Um, yeah, fraudulent yeah. claims, yeah, very scary. Um, I think the important thing is knowing your client, knowing who you're insuring. And, um, and certainly at, at, at Chubb, uh, we take a, a great deal of pride in, in getting to know, working with uh, specific brokers, um, and we don't go direct. Um, we expect the broker to know the client. We know the client very, very well, particularly on personal lines. Um, you know, we visit their homes, we get detailed information. So we know all about them, we know about their lifestyle, etc. And then that helps us whenever they do submit a claim. It means that we can then respond to it very quickly. Because in that personal lines market, that's where speed does come in and is very important. Mm -hmm. Certainly, again, on the commercial side, again, it's all about knowing your client and knowing what their business is about and knowing what their aspirations are and how they're going to take and develop their business. And then when they submit the claim, then clearly you have to make sure that it's, you, know, you validate the claim as you would with anything. Um, but that just because you, know, you have this, we, we have bespoke policies or we deal with high net worth, doesn't mean to say that you know, we've got everyone who's very honest out there. Of course not. I think one of the things that you've got to be very careful about more is the opportunistic fraud, whereby you've got someone who actually didn't enter their head to make a fraudulent claim, but then when the, something does happen, then instead of losing one or two items, they've perhaps lost three or four, and or perhaps they've increased or inflated the values of those claims. So that's where, you, again, you have to be particularly vigilant. So um, there's no easy answer. I think you just have to have very well-trained staff. I think you have to know the right questions, but you also have to know the, the people you're dealing with. <coughs> Thank you. It's interesting. I've, I've spoken to various people in the London market, and often I've been told by several people, well, we don't really worry too much about fraud in the London market. But uh, obviously, I think that's not actually the case. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, would you like to develop that idea a little? Yes, um, I think everything Lynn said is completely correct. But um, uh, here's where I think software can come in and help you. I mean, there is very sophisticated software out there now, which certainly in the personal line space, particularly on the motor side, but also home and contents policies, where once you've made a claim, you're, you're data, your details um, is entered into the system and if you subscribe to that system you can cross refer and see if these people have made claims and it's, it's incredibly detailed down to things like mobile phone numbers. They'll, they'll see whether that mobile phone number has come up before on a claim and uh, you can then start to see whether there's a pattern developing. That works well in the personal line space and in the mass market space. It doesn't work nearly so well in the sophisticated insured or the larger insured or the more specialised area. Um, and this is where, again, I agree, having talented and very competent claims people comes into it. Um, you don't always have to be a rocket scientist to, to, to spot a fraud, it has to be said. Um, I mean, we, we had one the other day where, where somebody asked us for £50,000 um, because uh, he was injured in a workplace accident and needed the money to buy two kidneys. And, um, <laughs> and he sent us bank details where we could wire the money. Um, I, I was tempted to ask him where he was going to buy the kidneys, but... Um, <laughs> So that, 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 that sort of thing jumps out at you and, and, and the claims adjuster was handling the claim. She immediately came to see me and we notified our compliance department and we started down the right channels um, of investigation. Um, uh, but they're not always as obvious as that, unfortunately. But usually a, a good and careful analysis of a claim will weed out a significant number of, of uh, fraudulent claims. Thanks. Anybody else like to add to that? David? Yeah, can I add, uh, just a couple of comments. I think fraudulent claims, I, I, just two observations. One is, I think, there's a fine line between fraudulent claims and claims which you weren't expecting when you actually wrote the policy. An example I'll give you is, is in a scenario under which an organisation is purchased by another organisation, the insurance policy stops being a risk mitigation and becomes an asset. And so the new owner may view that insurance policy very differently from the way in which it was originally sold. Now, is that fraud or is that just good utilisation of um, an, uh, an investment banker? Don't know, we'll have our own views <laughs> on either side, just something to think about. The other area I'd ask a question about fraudulent claims, and I've been careful with my use of words, or well, uncareful with my use of words, is if you take, say, for example, something such as the recent Thailand floods, where there's massive underinsurance in that territory, are we doing as enough as an insurance industry to make sure that the, the actual sums insured in a lot of the territories, where, which are showing massive economic growth, are actually sufficient? Mm. If not, all we're doing is, when the event happens, we're going to have the problem to deal with retrospectively. That's a significant, that must be a significant problem if what you're insuring has actually changed in character between when the policy was uh, initiated and potentially when a claim comes through. Very much so. I mean, if you look at how Asia is developing at the moment, I mean, the growth rates there are just phenomenal. If you, if you applied 5% you know, inflation over the last 10 years to some sort of industrial property, Not going to work at all. you're going to be in completely the wrong place now. So, and, and, Similar question I'd ask to the audience for your home insurance policies. Mm -hmm. When it comes around and it increases by RPI every year, 
do you just tick the box or do you yeah. actually go back and say, actually, no, I, I bought a load more stuff for the house now and that probably needs to be a 20, 25% increase? Yeah. I'll leave that for you only honestly. Uh, David, would you like to add something? Something about expensive windsurfing equipment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in the commercial space, space, I'd like to say that uh, there, aren't, uh, there isn't a problem with uh, fraudulent claims. Um, I'd like to say it, but unfortunately it does happen. Um, uh, our, our example uh, of the, uh, the, the other party um, using the product in a way that wasn't expected is in the DNO space is the, uh, the liquidator coming in and actually thinking, well, I've got to realise the assets into the business. The D's and O's have got uh, an insurance policy. How can I use this against them? Um, and I'd say that some of those claims that uh, liquidators have attempted to bring on the insurance policy is, um, let's not say fraudulent, but uh, the way in which <coughs> those claims are being pleaded is specifically pleaded in a way in which to trigger and use the policy, which I think is, is certainly verging towards dishonesty. Um, and, and then on global companies, um, we, we do get examples where you know, the, the branch office that hasn't had the turnover that it wanted down in, in uh, Africa or somewhere um, actually makes a claim. Um, and, uh, and there's a fraudulent element to that claim or the claims fraud itself. And uh, global head office, um, very honest, very trustworthy, um, have no idea themselves that it's fraudulent and are absolutely shocked when um, it's pointed out to them that there are these concerns. Um, so it's a management thing with clients as well. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We had one question on the round table at the back here. Mr. Crossley, it was oh, you. Yes, sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tim Crossley from Phineos. Just following on from Graham's comment about the claims ecosystem, is there one innovation that each of the panel members would like to bring forward from other insurance markets that they feel could be of significant benefit to the London market. I'm asking this because I do sometimes feel we are uh, slightly insular and don't take the most of these uh, global, broader opportunities. Thank you. I think David Lane will start with you and work our way towards me. Okay, Put you up first. Um, I'm, I'm going to take an example from a non-insurance entity, and that was it was interesting earlier on with Graham when he had Amazon up there. Um, and the example is, is I bought an ink cartridge on Friday via Amazon. And I've actually totted it up and I've had 11 text messages and four emails. Um, if everyone's pleased to know, the ink cartridge has been successfully put on the loading the van for delivery to my house where I'm not uh, for later on this afternoon. I think the challenge there is it's having access, having that transparency, having the open, open type nature of the systems to allow the insured to see effectively the entire chain through and everybody else. The only question I, I think you need to be careful of is, is how open that then becomes. And so we need to be careful that we don't just create a completely open environment <coughs> where personally I would quite, if I have uh, a commercially sensitive claim, I'd want to be very clear I knew who was seeing the full mm -hmm. details of that claim. <coughs> indeed, indeed. So the, the part of the example I was using about the, the social media type page for the bodily injury claim, again, I had the questions from people, well, but that could be sensitive information. You've got all these people logging into it. And the answer really comes back to, this is, this is a problem that all social media faces. People put, put things up. The person who owns the information should be the person who decides who sees it. So in that case, it's the claim, it's bodily injury, it's the claimant. The claimant should be able to decide on their page, well, this is medical information, so actually only my doctor sees this. My claims handler can see a summary from the doctor, but not the detailed information. Uh, this information is about payments, or, or perhaps a nurses or physiotherapist can see that, but not somebody else. So it's the person who, there should be, in any kind of open system, there really has to be those checks and balances so that somebody has control over who has visual access, who has update access, and so on to those things. It's absolutely vital. You're quite right. It is a concern, and it has to be dealt with. Lynn. It's interesting because, um, you know, we've all got all sorts of things that we can relate to now with regard to, you know, we've got iPhones and iPads and social networks and Twitter and all the, the you know, those various things which people think are all very creative and innovative. <coughs> and sometimes I think that it's actually quite a good idea to go back to basics. Because if I've got a claim, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking from personal experience, but I, I had a claim myself um, about 12 months ago when my kitchen was flooded. And to actually speak to somebody who knew what they were talking about 
was actually really, really good. Um, um, before I'd been put through to call centres, I'd been, I could see it was a tick box exercise that I was going mm. through and et cetera. And, and I find that really concerning, the fact that the person I was speaking to, again, um, were, were, were almost following a script. And it was a real education for someone like me who normally deals in the high network area and, um, and then having to deal in this mass market. And it came down to me and I thought to myself, actually with all of the innovation that we have and all of this wonderful technology, I just wanted to speak to somebody who could deal with me in an empathetic way and technically know what they were talking about and know how to get my claim from cradle to grave with the least pain. And I think sometimes we get a bit embroiled with all the high tech stuff and we need to go back to those basics about what really counts when someone has a... You know, because the claims department at the end of the day, we're, we're the fourth emergency service. Because normally something not very nice has happened and then you're making use of the claim and you're turning a very negative into a very positive situation. And I just think that sometimes we, we lose sight of that and we need to remember that. Thank you, Lynn. That's a, and I find that a very good example as well of how the claims providers provide you not just with a cheque, they're providing you with expertise Absolutely. that actually assists you in the way. And the same thing applies, probably applies right across the, the, all, all markets. Mm. Act, access to expertise and access to empathy and communication is vitally important, whether it's a personal claim or whether you're in your professional role at work and you're handling a claim. Yes. Mm. Robert. Um, and it's actually a similar theme to, uh, to Lynn, but on the, on the commercial and uh, sort of, uh, sophisticated lines. Um, <laughs> and without wishing to be too controversial, I'm going to come back to ECF for a minute. Um, one of the things where I think ECF has not um, delivered, and it was not com completely not by design, I, I must stress, is that it, is, it has not delivered a, a, a better um, claim service to uh, allow interaction between brokers and underwriters on the claims where a dialogue is actually required. In fact, quite the reverse. A lot of brokers have scaled down the people who they employ to advocate their clients' claims and simply upload information and data onto ECF and then allow underwriters and their claims departments to look at it and respond. So we've removed the human element. Now, for mass claims, for straightforward, simple claims, for notifications of circumstances which may or may not give rise to a claim in the future, that's all great and that works wonders. But sometimes when you've got a difficult claim, and the claim that David put up right at the beginning, the uh, uh, one that was not looked at for four months and was only then given a reservation of rights, would be a classic example where ECF wouldn't work. You need somebody who is sophisticated and intelligent on behalf of the client, and that usually will be the broker, to come in and talk to the underwriter, or their, and, sorry, their, their, the claims department, and to explain what the claim's all about, explain why the claim is covered under the contract, and have a discussion and a dialogue about the, the problematic areas, and at least, if nothing else, get a shopping list of the information that's required to help through the process and understand whether that claim is going to be covered in whole or in part, and if not, why not? And if um, only parts of it, then why other parts of it are not covered? And that, that, that part of the process, I think, is being removed and slowly dying away as a result of the um, advent of ECF and uh, electronic platforms for exchanging claims information with brokers. Thank you. David? Um, I'm pleased to say that uh, one of the objectives I've given my team this year is to send 20% less email. Um, so Robert will see our guys coming knocking on his door. Um, from the systems perspective, I would like to see it used in two ways. I'd like to see the data gathered and the data used to sell the London market. Um, we have a, a fantastic group of insurers and individuals uh, in the London market. I don't think we sell it well enough from the claims side of things. How it works, what's being paid, um, what we are covering, it's not uh, sold, and we don't gather that data. And then the other side <coughs> I'd like to see, the collation of data, is, uh, is to actually use it for insureds, as I mentioned earlier when I was speaking. Um, if, um, if Robert's got uh, a book of 50 asset managers and he's starting to note a trend of claims against asset managers, um, tell me. Tell me, and I'll tell our clients. And those other 30-odd clients may actually be able to stop that trend. They may never have a loss because they can take anticipatory action to ensure it doesn't happen to them. Um, mm. But if the insurance market sits on that data and doesn't share it, actually what's going to happen is it is going to happen to them and another claim is going to come in. So let's start using the data we're gathering and using it for risk management and using it with our clients for risk management purposes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, mm -hmm. vitally important all these things. As we said before, this is a, a market event in which you're all competing with each other, or companies within the market are competing with each other. But of course, as a market, the London market faces stiff competition from elsewhere in the world. So it has to be competitive, it has to be innovative, and claims is, it, at the end of the day, from the customer's perspective, claims is your showcase on the world, and of course has to have that attention. Well, we were due to finish at 1.15, it is now 1.15, so we don't have any more time for any more questions, and if you look at your, um, your, your programmes, you'll see there's a whole range of uh, topics, such as Solvency 2 and litigation and so on, that we didn't really test our panel on, but if we were to do that, we'd probably still be here at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So um, I think I'd like you all to give, us, uh, give them a, 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 um, some applause, give them some thanks. I think it's been very interesting this session. So just uh, some, to show your appreciation for the panel there. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>